Uh, I want us to do our traditional Easter greeting. Uh, I will say he is risen, and I'm going to ask you if you would reply, he is risen indeed. And I'd like it to be loud enough that we can hear it uh, all throughout our parking lot. He is risen. He is risen. No, oh, my goodness, it's so wonderful to be able to hear that. Would you open your Bibles, please, to John chapter 3? John chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 16 and following this morning. John chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. Before we start, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we humbly bow before you this morning and we praise you and we thank you for an empty tomb. We thank you that we serve a living Savior. We thank you, Lord, that you were victorious over death, hell, the grave. And Lord, that in your victory, you now have the keys to all. Lord, that we might believe on your name, that our sins might be covered, that we might be justified. All of this, all of this we glory in and we're assured of because of Resurrection Sunday. Lord, I can only imagine the disciples as they came that day. And Lord, they saw the empty tomb. And Lord, from defeat in just a moment, victory, victory began to fill their hearts. Lord, I can't even imagine what it was like to see you that day on Resurrection Sunday. Lord, we come in your name today we ask you, Lord, to give us ears to hear and hearts that, that will to obey. Father, we stop and remember those that uh, need our prayers today, those that are sickly. Lord, we've got many that are very critical, and we lift them to thee. We pray, God, for healing. We pray, God, for just the resurrection hope that we have in you. Lord, I pray for some Easter miracles today. Lord, that we might glorify your name in that. Lord, I thank you for all who've come. I pray that we might be blessed and encouraged. I pray for Christians around the world this morning as we celebrate our Savior's resurrection. I love you and I praise you and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask, as we've done in the past, that in each of your vehicles, if you would uh, read at this time, just read aloud in all of your vehicles, uh, John chapter 3 verses 16 through 21, and I'm going to give you time to do that where you won't have to listen to me. John chapter 3, verses 16 through 21, if you'd read that now at this time. The Word of God says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in Jesus is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. The Apostle Paul made the declaration that he wanted the people that he preached to, he wanted the audience that heard his preaching to know one thing, to know one person 
to know one fact, to understand one premium got a, a topic, and that is Jesus Christ crucified, buried, resurrected. It's important that we understand that we must come to Jesus Christ believing in the one who died on a cross for us, that we must come to him who was buried. Uh, he was dead and he was buried in a borrowed tomb. And we come to him as the resurrected Lord who is alive forevermore. Paul said in Corinthians, if there were no resurrection, that all the preaching of Christ, all the declarations of Christ would become meaningless. The Apostle Paul declared that faith in Jesus, were he not resurrected, would be useless because all the claims he made hinged on the fact that he would live again. If he were still dead, they would be useless. All the witnesses, all the ones who claimed to have seen Jesus, all the preachers of resurrection, all the preachers since Resurrection Sunday would be declared liars and untruthful. If Jesus Christ were not resurrected, no one could be redeemed. No one could be saved from their sin because it wasn't just the cross. <clears throat> the cross was where Jesus died. The resurrection is where he was proven to have been the sacrifice that could bring forgiveness to sin. Paul said if Jesus Christ had not been resurrected, that everyone who died in him Everyone who died claiming to have believed in Jesus Christ died as fools with no hope whatsoever. And he concluded in 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 15 that Christians, if Jesus Christ were not risen, Christians would be the most pitiable, the most pitiful people in the entire world. There's a story that tells of a traveler who is attempting to travel around the globe. Along the way, he found himself in a region where he was trapped in quicksand, <coughs> and he slowly began to sink. Confucius came by, and Confucius said to him, it is evident that man should avoid such situations, and he went on his way. Muhammad came by and said, Allah, it is the will of Allah. And he went his way. Buddha came by and said, let this man's dilemma be an illustration for many. And he went on his way. Krishna came by and said, better luck next time. And he went on his way. Jesus Christ walked up, reached out to the man and pulled him out of the quicksand. You see, the wonderful thing about Christianity and the wonderful thing about our Lord and our God who loves us is that while there are other uh, prophets and teachers and, and, and religious leaders who told people what they had to do to be spiritual or, or to approach God as they would see it, only Christianity... And only the gospel of Jesus Christ shows a God who loves the world, the true and the living God who sent his son not to condemn it. He sent his son to save the world. He didn't send Jesus to give us quotes and quips and things that we could tell and things that we might meditate upon, although every word that came from his mouth is recorded in scripture is worthy of all those things. The purpose God gave, had in sending Jesus Christ was for a reason, to save us. And beside that, all these other religious leaders, all these other ones that I mentioned in that little story, their grave is still full of bones and dust. Jesus Christ's tomb is empty, and his grave is empty. John 3.16 25 words. It takes you seven seconds to quote it in a speaking melody. J. 
John 3.16 memorized by nearly every child who's ever attended a vacation Bible school or come to a church Sunday school. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In those 25 words, we have the gospel summed up with an absolute view of why the heart of God, the purpose of God, the will of God, the cause of Christ, all of this is found in that short verse. I add the second one because I believe that it adds some clarity even to 316. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, the son, Jesus Christ, might be saved. That Jesus Christ came, and that Jesus Christ came to this earth, that he was born, that he became one of us, this is the heart of the gospel. But it begins even before that. The first thing that John tells us is that God loved. And we must understand that in the spirit of Easter and in the resurrection uh, victory that we have in Christ, the story of our redemption was birthed in the heart and the love of Almighty God. For God so loved the world. There are so many people that have a terrible image of God. They have an image of a God who is vengeful and a God who is waiting for them to mess up so he can punish them. Churches are full of people who walk around with guilt and, and they walk around condemned, believing that God is harsh and unloving. And yet we find in the very beginning parts of the gospel, in the very essence and foundation of the good news of Jesus Christ, that all of this began because God so loved. Now, if we just read that, that God loved and there was nothing else, it's sort of like us telling somebody we love them, but they're words only. But God did not act on words only. For God so loved the world that he gave. There was a gift given. We think of the gift at Christmas, the gift of the birth of Christ, but I'm here to tell you the gift of Christ was the gift of a sacrifice, one who would be able to present us clean and justified before the Lord because of his death and his blood and his obedience. But it was birthed, the, the very plan of God was that he would give his only begotten son. And then we read the next words that I believe are some of the most beautiful words whosoever believeth whosoever believeth aren't you glad that word whosoever is there if there was not a whosoever we could limit it we could say that only a few we could say only the elite we could say only the religious we could say only the baptist or we might say any other denomination but the word of god says whosoever believeth in him. The idea of believing is not a mental uh, belief. It is not uh, an intellectual belief. The word believeth is adhering to and relying on and holding to Christ. It is just as God loved and gave. Believing is us believing and clinging. It leads us to that action of holding to Christ and Christ alone. There's nothing else. It's not Christ plus anything that believeth on him, him, that is how we are saved. 17 reminds us that Jesus did not come into this world to condemn this world. I want to ask you a sobering question. Why didn't Jesus come into the world to condemn the world? Obviously, his purpose was to save. But I'm going to tell you, it tells us a little bit further down, man was condemned already. In the garden, when man sinned, when Satan tempted, when Satan led and, and, and lied to Eve, but ultimately Eve sinned, Adam sinned, they acted upon the, the deception of Satan. But when they sinned, when they sinned, 
The Bible says through one man sin entered into this world. And after Adam, all the descendants, all the human beings ever born, were born with a nature to sin. It was what we were born with. The Bible says the soul that sinneth shall surely die. That is the truth. The soul that sins will surely die. And do you know who uses that truth to accuse humanity? Do you know who it is? Our enemy, Satan. Satan has used that declaration, which is truth, to accuse every human being that's ever been born. And in that accusation, and in that, in that ability that he had, and that leeway that was given to him, he held the power of death over so many. But I'm here to tell you that the accuser, the one who is the enemy to our soul, he has been defeated in the death of Christ on the cross. I'm sure on that day when Jesus Christ was breathing his last, and by, by the way, Jesus Christ was in full control even until his last breath. He yielded up the ghost. He was in authority that day. Satan was not in authority. The Romans were not in authority. The Jewish leaders were not winning. I'm going to tell you who was winning. Almighty God's plan was coming to pass. And in that day, he won. He died, though. He died on a cross that he might be resurrected. I want to share a scripture with you. If you would, please turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And I want to read just a couple of verses. Hebrews chapter 2. And I want to read verses 14 and 15. It says, Inasmuch then as children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The writer of Hebrews is telling us because the children of God, the ones that belong to him, because they're human beings, we're made of flesh and blood. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became flesh and blood. He could not die as the Son of God in spirit. He became flesh and blood so that he could die as one of us. But in that death, he breaks the power of Satan, who had the power of death. It was in this way that Jesus is able to set free all those who have lived lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We live in interesting days right now, don't we? We wear masks. We spray disinfectant. We practice our social distancing. Never said that word before the last few weeks. I've never thought of the statement flattening the curve, but we hear it so much that we'll use it from now on. We see the world racing for vaccines. We're looking for cures. We don't like to consider dying, and no one does. I believe part of the anxiousness and the uncertainty that so many feel today, you turn the news on and you see and hear the words, the morgues are filled. You see pictures of mass burials, of many caskets being buried in New York. You read the stories of refrigerated trucks lining up around hospitals. We were told that two million would die, then one million, then 250,000, then 100,000. 
as they've made their models. All of these models, all of this based on the fear of human beings dying. Listen to me. I've said this before and I'll say it again. One out of one people die. Everyone in this parking lot will have a day of death. I certainly don't want to get a virus and die, but if I do, then it was my appointed time. We do not have to live in the fear of death, and the very purpose of Jesus Christ's coming was that we would not have to live in fear of death. If we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have relied on him and trusted in him, seeking him to save us, seeking him to cleanse us, seeking us to cover him. My friend, listen to me. You can live life without fear at all. There is no greater thing that you'll face than death. And we read right here in Hebrews that Jesus Christ came to release those who the fear of death were their lifetime subject to bondage. He has freed us from the greatest enemy that we will face, death. Death has now become a doorway. There is no sting. It is victory in Jesus Christ. There's nothing to fear about death when you're in Jesus Christ. When we say that Jesus Christ came to save, we know that he has come to remove the accusation of sin. We know that Jesus Christ has come to remove the penalty of sin, which was death and separation. We know that Jesus came to save us from the punishment of sin, the presence of sin, the bondage of sin. We are set free in Jesus Christ from all those things, and we have absolutely nothing to fear. So why does man reject Jesus? Why do people reject Christ? The reasons are many. Well, preacher, there's too many hypocrites in the church. There are people who say one thing and live another. Preacher, if you knew the people, I don't need to know anybody. I can tell you right now, I don't need to name a name, but I can assure you there are hypocrites in our churches. Well, Brother Bud, I have a hypothetical reason. I have a philosophical argument about religion and about God and where all this came from and in how it mirrors other uh, religions throughout history. And I just, I have hypotheticals and, and I just have some sticking points that I can't work through. Brother Bud, you know there's some difficult passages in the Bible that are hard to understand and explain. Some people feel that they're inconsistencies and because of that, but Brother Bud, because of that, I just there's not enough evidence for me to believe like the, the scriptures require me to. Brother Bud, I'm just not sure if this is the right time. My feelings are kind of messed up about this. I'm not sure this is what I want or my need in my life right now. You know, Brother Bud, there's, there's faith, but there's also science, and there's evolution. And then it stands in stark contrast to creation. And I just have an issue with, with what science says and what uh, scientists say and what Scripture says. <clears throat> and I can't reconcile the two. Oh, I could go on and on and on until tonight about all the excuses that human beings offer for not believing on Jesus Christ. But I'm here to declare to you that there is only one single reason, one single reason why men and women, boys and girls, do not give their hearts to Christ, and it's found right here. They prefer to live in darkness. Darkness. Jesus Christ the light. Jesus Christ who exposes. Jesus Christ who brings out the truth in all of us. When we hear the gospel, we, re we see the cross, and we see a bleeding Savior and a suffering Savior. We must realize it's our sin that put him there. It's our need for a Savior that he was there. 
we must realize that we are sinners and lost and unable to do anything about it. The scriptures tell us in 1 John chapter 3 that he who believes in Jesus Christ is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten. And this is a condemnation. Light has come into the world. Light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. This is the reason that people reject Christ. They can make a myriad of excuses of why they don't want to come to Jesus Christ. But in the end, it is the preference of darkness. Paul said that their eyes have been blinded by the enemy of this world, Satan. Folks, listen to me. If you're here today and you've not believed on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're listening uh, to this message uh, later on the Internet and you have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and you've rejected him and rejected religion or rejected people within the church or have all these vain philosophies, I'm telling you the truth is you prefer to remain in darkness rather than come to the light and have your deeds reproved and repent of your sin and believe on Jesus Christ. And that is the truth. And it is the gospel truth. God loves you. And he didn't just say words. He proved it. While you were still a sinner and I was still a sinner, Christ died to save the ungodly. That was us. We believed on him. We believe on what he did. We believe on his work on the cross. We rejoice in the resurrection. And we have trusted Christ. Christ is the only thing that we have to hold on to for hope and assurance in this godless world that we live in. I want to close with a scripture this morning from 1 Corinthians. I quoted 15 a good bit this morning. But I want to just simply close this morning with a word to you. The Apostle Paul speaking. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures that he was seen by Peter and then he was seen by the twelve which are the disciples after that he was seen by over 500 people at one time of whom the greater part remain to the present some have died after that he was seen by James he was seen by all the other apostles then last of all he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. The gospel accounts that we have in our hands, the scriptures, are from eyewitness accounts of men, women, large groups who witnessed a living Savior alive after he died, after he was buried, after he was resurrected. With that confidence, we gather today to glorify the Lord and to praise him this day. If you're here today and you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, right where you're at today, right you've heard the gospel today. This is the good news. God loves you and he gave Jesus. Jesus came, he died, he paid the penalty. He won the victory. He's removed the power of Satan. He's removed his ability to accuse you and keep you in the dark. If you will believe upon him today, Jesus Christ and what he did for you, would you bow your head even right now? <clears throat> and I'm going to ask everybody here, well, we might just bow our heads right now. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for accepting the cup that only you could partake of. Thank you. 
for becoming the covering and the salvation that we have in you and you alone. Lord Jesus, I ask and I pray that today, that if there be anyone here that needs to call out to you in salvation, that you would reveal yourself so clearly to them that they might call out to you before it's everlasting too late, before their blood and their hand and their life is required of thee. Lord, I just place this moment in your hands and I ask it to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here today and you need to ask Christ to save you, why not bow your head right now? Why not confess your sins to him as a sinner, belief in him as a savior? Why not yield your life even right now to Jesus Christ and surrender to him? Ask him to come into your heart. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior. What would keep you right this minute from doing that? Would you do that right now, brother, sister? Would you be willing to ask him to save you even right now to his glory? To his glory. Let's bow together for a closing prayer. I want to thank all of you for coming today. I hope that this will be a great day in the Lord for all of us, that we will spend time and just praise the Lord for all he's done, that we might share the hope we have in Christ. It's not just a happy Easter. It's just happy resurrection. It's happy that Jesus is alive. And folks, if he's alive, he's coming again. He's coming again. I'm telling you what, and I think it's soon. Would we share that with others uh, as we celebrate? Let's bow together as we pray. Father, thank you for this time that we've had to gather in thy name. Thank you for the words. These are your words in John chapter 3. These aren't someone else's words. These are words that came right out of your mouth, that your Father so loved the world that he gave you, that we might believe in you, that we might be saved, Lord, and that we understand that those who don't believe in you have chosen darkness over light, and that's just it. That's the truth. And, Lord, their, their destiny is already secured. They're condemned already. We were condemned already. How we praise you in grace and mercy and love, how you reached into our life, revealed yourself to us, revealed the truth of God, revealed the love of God through the Holy Spirit that we might call upon Jesus Christ and be saved. Lord, I pray today if there's anyone here that, that knew you not, that today they know you, that even now they're rejoicing in you, and we give you glory for that. As we leave here today, Lord, we pray your continued protection over our congregation and our families. We pray, God, that you would uh, keep us safe, but at the same time that we would live fearless, Christ-centered lives in a dark world. Thanks be to God for the unspeakable gift of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you and thank you for being here today. God bless and have a great afternoon, everyone, in Christ.